Oh, when we give you a copy of this, you want a, a DVD, I'm assuming. Oh, that's fine, yeah. And a VHS. Yeah, work. Oh, yeah, not a VHS. Yeah, the, a lot of the older veterans are still <laughs> VHS. Okay, we are rolling. All right. This is a interview at the Division of Military and Naval Affairs headquarters in Latham, New York. It is the 9th of January, 2008, approximately 1 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? And my full name is John Andrew Ross. Uh, place of birth is Troy, New York, and the date of birth was 16 November 1972. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Prior to entering service, I had some college. Okay. had not finished. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, obviously, you enlisted. Why? I had, uh, I had originally signed contracts with the active component and due to issues with my first marriage, uh, when we split, I didn't go active because I knew I'd never see my children again, so I entered the National Guard instead. Uh, that way I could still join the military, because ever since I was a kid, I wanted to join the military. I was always a little G.I. Joe, mm -hmm. and uh, my buddies and I. And uh, instead of getting uh, getting into the military through active component, I wanted to join the National Guard. Okay. Uh, when did you join? I joined in uh, 96, 1996. Okay. Um, where did you go for basic training? And I went to Fort Benning, uh, Georgia for uh, basic training, home the infantry. i have been in infantry my entire career. Uh, not because I had to be, just because I wanted to be. I'm one of those sick individuals. <laughs> How long was your basic? Uh, I entered the reception center at Johnston Hall 21 October and graduated one station unit training on 13 or 14 February the following year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I wound up spending about two weeks in the reception center before they sent me down range just because of backup of soldiers at that time. All right. Um, did you get any ex basic other training outside of the basic, uh, specialized training at all? Negative. Uh, when we were down there, I tried, they started handing out some contracts for airborne and air assault, and I desperately tried to get one, but they were only giving them to the active component soldiers because they said the states wouldn't have fund the. They wouldn't fund the, the, the slots. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was it on my initial. Okay. Well, just tell us about your assignments then from. Oh, my assignments from that one. I first entered the Army National Guard. I entered for Delta Company, first the 105th Infantry. Um, we, uh, my position was uh, I was in a tow gunner unit, an 11 hotel unit, which is a motorized anti tank. Uh, basically, drive around in Humvees with an MC 20 tow system on the top and blowing tanks up. Um, now, what, explain what the tow system means. Uh, a tube launch, optically tracked, wire guided. It's a, it's a missile system that uh, it's not a fire and forget. It's one that you have to track its entire flight. It has a, a, a line attached to it, and it constantly sends back and forth information from the missile to the system while it's in flight. And uh, the system, if you traverse the system, you can actually traverse the missile also, so you can actually chase a target with it if need be. And because uh, obviously not all your targets are going to be stationary, um, you penetrate up to three feet of armor, including reactive armor, depending on the designation of the missile, and um, secondary weapons, 50 cal, Mark 19, all vehicle mounted, uh, 50 cal being a 12.7 millimeter machine gun, and uh, Mark 19 is 40 millimeter grenade launcher. They're chain linked like a machine gun. It's a pretty neat weapon, mm -hmm. but. Uh, so uh, that, that's basically the, the tow and our two secondary weapons. Uh, I, I spent over roughly my first eight plus years in Delta Company as a tow gunner uh, until after September 11th. Uh, September 11th, we were initially activated to go to the city, but uh, due to an overwhelming response, they held us out of the city and eventually sent us to the uh, Air Force Base down in Newburgh to uh, conduct training to go into the airports and nuclear power plants, which uh, my first assignment after September 11th was um, going into JFK International Airport. Uh, we worked the, the Delta Terminal, Terminal 3. And uh, Now what kind of specialized training did you have for that? They gave us uh, different, they put us through FBI screenings, and they put us through a bunch of different screenings. As far as actual training, there was uh, certification I got through, uh, what is it, FAA or 
trying to think of the, the flight authority. FAA. Yeah, they, they put us they put us through one certification through. It was nothing really that extensive. It was something that we wrapped up in basically two days worth of time, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they gave us a little paper certificate for it. But uh, then they moved us right to the airports from there. Uh, to tell you the truth, I've been. I, I did not enlist to go into the AGR, the Active Guard Reserve Program. I, I enlisted as a traditional soldier in M Day, one week in a month, two weeks a year. Uh, besides the fact that I've never had a year like that, uh, after September 11th, I pretty much put the cap on it uh, between activations and just volunteering because I, because I enjoy what I do. I, I have spent a lot of time away from my civilian employer, but that, that's when it really, really picked up from there because we went from. Uh, now, let me go to JFK. Um, what were your duties there, your assignments while you were there? Uh, when I was there, I was an E-5 sergeant. I was just about to move into a sixth position prior to that happening. Uh, right before we actually, we had gone to JR, or we had gone to JRTC right before going to, uh, it'd be right before September 11th, and that's the Joint Readiness Training Center down in Louisiana. It's one of the combat rotation schools you have to go to prior to a deployment. And um, we had gone there because we were originally supposed to be tasked with a mission to the Balkans. Uh, I have no idea whether we were supposed to go to Bosnia or Kosovo or wherever. Um, when we came back from that, three weeks later is when September 11th happened, so obviously there was not going to be, you know, with how bad New York was hit, there wasn't going to be an overseas deployment at that point for us. Um, I was an E-5 at the time, and when they put us into the airport, we were split into shifts, a day shift, a night shift, and uh, each terminal was broken down into its own miniature chain of command, and uh, it was kind of like a somewhat of an NCO IC under, underneath uh, the one NCO in charge of uh, our terminal. Uh, basically, I, I still had to stay in the post, but you know, checking on the welfare of your soldiers as you would normally do as an E5. Um, but for the most part, we were, we were standing uh, posts uh, behind the screening point. The way the terminal was set up is no one could gain access into the terminal unless they were flying. So nobody seeing their, their loved ones off or whatever could enter. It was just the people coming in. And they had the screening points right there at the door. So as soon as you walked through the door, your luggage was searched. And then you went to check in. And uh, those are that was pretty much my job. Was that pretty much routine? Or were there any incidents or anything? Oh, there were incidents. Uh, we had an incident where um, each of us had our own little in internal communication besides the ones uh, just little radios we had of our own with little earbuds, and uh, we had the radios that contact the Port Authority in case anything happened, and there was U.S. Marshals and everybody else there, Customs. Uh, I got a call from one of my soldiers one day that uh, a bunch of boxes had come through and they were marked, uh, they were marked honey, basically. Basically, they were supposed to be honey, and it was some, some gentleman of Middle Eastern descent that uh, claimed that they owned a, a honey business, and. Uh, they exported it, and on our terminal we had a flight to uh, to Yemen, and uh, so obviously there was a lot of watches as far as you know what the people boarding for that. Uh, these guys, when when the boxes were sent through the X-ray and they were scanned, I believe it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of cash and about two hundred fifty thousand dollars worth of. Uh, checks or bonds, or I don't remember at this mm -hmm. point, but it was a half a million dollars worth of stuff, and fire briefings from customs, anything over $10,000 required paperwork. Um, there was a little bit of issue with those gentlemen where they, they kind of, when we went to detain them and put them to the side, they kind of put up a little struggle and we had to flex cuff a couple of them, but they also wound up having a couple of miscellaneous items like box cutter type things, no different than, you know, September 11th when that actually happened. Uh, there was that issue, that, that was one of the things that had happened. Um, I honestly don't know what came of that. After after we turned those people over, that was went into a totally different realm than us, uh, different agency. We had, uh, and, I, and we don't even know the, the seriousness of the extent with these gentlemen. Two Middle Eastern gentlemen had booked a flight to go to Amsterdam, and they booked one-way tickets. They had absolutely no check luggage, and it was the same MO as the hijackers from September 11th. And uh, so there was an operation set up to where we had to put soldiers there, you know, to try to get these guys when they came in to detain them, and there was marshals and everybody else. Uh, they detained the gentlemen, and uh, of course they canceled the flight. And uh, when going through and questioning them, they found nothing that they could really hold the guys on. 
Uh, the unfortunate part was the very next day they uh, put them back out so they could go on this flight again and uh, the passengers and the pilots nearly rioted right there in the airport after because they were all the same passengers from the mm -hmm. night before seeing that these gentlemen were getting back on the plane again and we, we had a little incident as a result of that but as far as anything uh, none of the things that ever happened were really newsworthy for whatever reason the guys with the honey boxes a whole different group of them tried to do it again another time it was the same deal a very large amount of money that had that happened twice in the first month we were down there so uh, there's a couple little scare white powder scares no different than what was going on in the news at the time which turned out to be nothing but uh, no one uh, no no serious issues besides those and the, uh, not on my terminal no, you were armed during this time? Yes, we were. We were carrying an M16A2 rifles, uh, which was our standard issue mm -hmm. at the time. Um, <laughs> did you have live ammo? We did have live ammunition. We had two magazines apiece, I believe, if I remember correctly. 15 rounds in one, 30 rounds in the other. 45 rounds was our, our issue. Um, we had to tone down our equipment going into uh, the airports. Being an infantry unit, obviously, our TA-50, our, our Alice gear, depending on whatever you want to call it because it changes so frequently. Our vests and our setup uh, appear apparently to be a little too threatening for, for civilian populace. They told us to tone it down, just suspenders, a belt, one canteen, two ammo pouches, and a first aid pouch. So we had to rip our gear apart and set it up to this, uh, what we were told to be not as non-threatening as our normal gear. And uh, we wore berets, we didn't wear helmets or Kevlar, ZZHs, or anything like that. Um, and, and that was that was pretty much a uniform for down there. Um, How long were you there? Uh, I was there to finish out 2001. Uh, I left because of a rotation in Germany. We had a rotation as a op floor, as opposing forces, basically to be the bad guys for a unit that was going to be deploying to Afghanistan at that time. Um, so uh, we did the rotation over at the, uh, at the time it was called the Combat Maneuver Training Center over in Germany, which is now the Joint Multinational Training Center. Basically anyone who's stationed OCONUS outside the continental US before they go to combat, that's the rotational school that they rotate through. Uh, we went, I went there and did a rotation as OP4 and as a bad guy uh, as to help train these guys to go out. Uh, that was my reason for that. That was January of 2002. Uh, as soon as I got back from that, our unit had a rotation in Puerto Rico. Uh, that was only uh, a four day. I got back from that and I went into Albany International Airport to continue the airport mission. Being from the Albany area, it worked out a lot better to, to come back uh, to this area. I didn't have to worry about being three hours away from home. Uh, for that mission, it was, it was the same thing, standing post, Albany Airport. Um, no significant issues in the time I was there at all. Nothing like New York City. It was a little bit more busy down there. Um, left that mission around the June-July time frame to go to our annual training. Uh, came back and I, we took that jump to go to annual training because one, the airports were ending and, and two, it was a good opportunity to train a lot of the new soldiers that had come in because so many of our guys joined that had joined at that time frame and expected to be going off to combat. They, you know, I, I want to go, I want to go fight the war in Afghanistan, had a ton of new kids join, and they wound up standing in airports. And it was a pretty big disappointment for a lot of those guys. And uh, this annual training was a chance for us to take all these new soldiers that weren't on mission and actually go to annual training and do infantry training. Uh, while we were there, Sergeant Barsalo and myself were approached by uh, Major Cleveland from our battalion who uh, notified us that the Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant mission had no decent NCOs on it, no decent leadership at all, and they were having a lot of issues, and asked if we would go down there. And Right after annual training, probably two weeks after annual training, I went down to Indian Point, and that was in July 2002, and I spent almost nine months down there. Now, were you AGR at that point? Or? Negative. I worked, Just, I worked okay. for United Parcel Service, normally. Uh, they've got my name on some books, and kind of free my face by this point but uh, I, every now and then in between missions I would go back to work maybe work a week three weeks and mm -hmm. then I'd get asked to do something else or I'd volunteer for something else and then I'd be gone again and then come back for a week or two 
Uh, at Indian Point, uh, guarding the nuclear power plant, we had uh, some stationary posts there. We had some mobile posts there with uh, Humvee vehicles. Uh, I wound up being uh, an NCOIC of one of the shifts down there. And uh, I had roughly 20 soldiers. Uh, it was a joint mission between uh, New York Army National Guard and the Naval Militia because uh, one of the borders of Indian Point is on the Hudson. So uh, we had a small boat there that we all used to joke, looked like the boat from the movie Jaws. Um, and he used to have this little tiny motorboat that would go out on patrols if a boat got too close to the shoreline. Um, we would put a couple of our soldiers out on there so there would actually be armed soldiers on the boat. Being the naval militia, they didn't have any weapons or anything like that. So that was the only way we could really make that, that post effective was to put a couple of our soldiers out there with weapons. It's the same thing, standard issue M16s. Um, one of the things that we had done for the Homeland Defense missions is anyone who had, be, because of the threatening nature and the fact that we wouldn't actually use them, we didn't send any of the heavier weapons like the M249 saw, which is the same caliber as the, the M16s, but uh, you know it's an automatic weapon with a higher rate of fire. Uh, any weapons that had 203 grenade launchers on them, they were, the 203s were removed from them. Um, and obviously nothing higher, no cruiser weapons or anything. Uh, we used tow thermal sites on the top of the Humvees, uh, which are uh, the MPAS-13 thermal sites, to be able infrared sites, thermal sites, which uh, we could use to scan through the tree lines to see if there's any heat signatures and people coming through the tree lines. Um, the, uh, the time I was there was relatively uneventful. I think the, the, the biggest things we had happen was uh, some kids trying to do some turkey hunting with weapons up by our northern perimeter. Our guys just saw some people wandering around with weapons, and uh, we went out and did some uh, infantry movement techniques to sneak up on them, grab a hold of them, and uh, I think besides their underwear, there were zero <laughs> casualties. Uh, <laughs> and uh, obviously, we turned them over to local authorities, and, and uh, they, they never went hunting turkey in the northern perimeter of Indian Point again. Uh, we had one issue where somebody from Hillary Clinton's office had come up to our front gate pretending to be an average citizen who needed directions. And uh, unfortunately, once you get to the front gate, in order to turn around, you have to come into the perimeter and go back out again. And our soldier, plus the Entergy Guard, that's the uh, Entergy is the, the service that's already down there, the Armed Guard, directed them through, and there was a state trooper at that post also, um, directed them through, turned them around, and they left. And the report went back to Hillary. Hillary Clinton's office that they gained access to the perimeter and they drove around and they got to see a whole bunch of things. So they did a big inquiry and they, and they sent a bunch of people down and basically we confronted the guy face to face and asked him to explain the route that he took, what were the buildings that he saw, or what did they even look like, mm -hmm. and he could obviously. So that, that was the biggest event in the time I was at Indian Point, other than when the power plant across the street had a one of its machines go down and caused a big fire at the same time there was a problem with one of the coolants at Indian Point and the alarms went off and we all thought we had a big attack going on. It was nothing. Uh, I did my nine months at Indian Point. I, I left Indian Point for February of 03 to go to a promotion school for my E6, uh, BNOC, uh, Basic non commissioned Officer course, uh, down in Fort Dix, New Jersey. I did my two weeks in that. I came back from that, and I was contacted by my company first sergeant to uh, come here to the Division of State uh, Military, <laughs> Division of Naval and Military Affairs building uh, because they had an issue where uh, they had a guard out front, but they weren't armed, and they had an issue where the uh, vehicle ran the checkpoint here, and they were a couple uh, Pakistani or Afghan national kids. They turned out to be students, but uh, the worst thing that I think they found a bunch of fake IDs in their car, and that was which be standard for mm -hmm. college kids, but and they had a lame excuse that they thought it was the on-ramp for the throughway or something. But um, after that, they decided not to take such a half-hearted approach to guarding state headquarters, and they began construction on the guard post and the uh, defense, and they brought myself here. They brought our first class, Marcelo, who you guys are going to talk to. Uh, he became an acting OIC for lack of officers. Now, where was your duty station prior to being here then locally? Uh, prior to coming here, I was at the, the two-week school, and prior to that, I was the nine months at Indian No, I, I meant you weren't assigned to a, like, an armory or I was something. still with Delta Company, okay. first the 105th okay. Infantry, okay. yes. 
Um, all this time, my unit affiliation was Delta 105, okay. uh, which no longer exists. Uh, 105th folded its flag, unfortunately. Uh, seeing that they had a significant amount of history and heritage to it. Um, we, uh, we came here uh, by wound up becoming the acting OIC because we had no officers, the officer in charge for uh, the second shift, which was afternoon to early evening, the eight hour stretch. And uh, we were on this mission for about seven months when we were pulled to become part of the second 108th to go to Iraq. Uh, we were pulled for that, um, basically my time here, other, other than learning to deal with people from state headquarters after coming from a line company was pretty uneventful here. Um, we left here, and uh, I left here and became part of Charlie Company 2nd 108th Infantry for purposes of deployment to Iraq, which was an 11 Bravo unit, which is still infantry, but it's the basic ground pounder, no vehicles involved, no tow systems, so it was definitely going to be a change. Um, I originally was placed on their unit manning roster as a last minute fill in a, I was an E6 at the time, as an E5 as a team leader which I didn't really seem to be too bad. I was going to wind up going to combat with only three soldiers under me, so not as bad as the nine that I would have had with myself. But uh, by the third day of our mobilization, I was in an E6 slot, and by the time we got into the country, I was an acting platoon sergeant. So, so my three soldiers wound up going to 36 very quickly. Um, we did our train up at Fort Drum, New York. Uh, that went from October... Our order started October 1st. We made it to Fort Trump, I believe, October 7th, and from no, 8th, October 8th. Uh, from the 8th till mid-January, we trained at Fort Trump. From mid-January to mid-February, we trained at Fort Polk, Louisiana, going to the Joint Readiness Training Center um, for our, uh, you know, basically prior to combat, our, our uh, schooling. Came back for a couple of weeks. They handed us brand new M4 rifles, still packed. We cleaned them up. They gave us 18 rounds to zero, and we grabbed our equipment and got on a plane. Um, we came into uh, Kuwait probably in early February of 2003, 2004, I'm sorry, and uh, spent a couple days back in uh, the rear echelon areas uh, back by city and uh, then went forward to uh, Camp Udari which is up near the border um, we probably spent uh, less than a week at Camp Udari and then uh, the platoon I was in at the time I was a squad leader in third platoon at that time um, our platoon wound up being the advance party to uh, fly up to Samara Iraq which is where we were stationed uh, the flight was actually going to take us into Balad, and then we were going to get convoy truck from there to Samara. Um, the platoon, uh, we boarded a C-130 with all our gear, and we were carrying several, we were carrying a couple hundred pounds plus a piece because our company, Charlie Company 2108, was pulled away from the entire 2108, and we were integrated into an active duty battalion. Basically, the, the 126, which is an active duty element from the 1st Infantry Division, basically had all 11 mics, which are uh, mechanized infantry, all in the Bradleys, Bradley fighting vehicles. They basically looked at the 2108 as, as we were being integrated and said, hey, we have all mechanized infantry, you have all straight leg, why don't we trade a company for a company, you guys can get some armor assets, and then we can get some straight leg assets, some on the ground assets, and everybody's happy, and we were the company that got traded. Um, we, uh, we came into LSA Anaconda, Logistical Supply Area Anaconda, or that's where our flight landed. We came in at night, and the nice part about flying in at night is when we flew over Baghdad, you could actually see the outline of the peninsula that you always wind up seeing on the news, and that's really all I saw of Baghdad. Uh, but, uh, so that was kind of neat, plus we didn't get shot at, so that was very nice too. Uh, we came to do uh, our, our combat landing LSA Anaconda, and although I've been in C 130s and 141s and C 5s numerous times, I had never done a combat landing, and that's what they jokingly refer to as flushing the toilet because you do the spiral all the way down until you hit the tarmac. So they did that, and they had everybody doing all they could to hold their stuff in because it was, it, it was different for most of us, uh, probably 90 plus percent of us. 
Uh, as we hit the tarmac, the vehicle, the, the, the bird hadn't even stopped and they've already got the ramp going down and they were screaming, you gotta grab your equipment and go because they were taking incoming. There was uh, incoming mortar rounds. Uh, we to this day don't know whether that was just them busting on us and making us run in the dark like a bunch of idiots or uh, whether or not they were legitimately taking contact. Uh, since we were tasked off as a separate company, we didn't know when we were going to get our supplies or our connexes, so we were carrying everything all the way down to our cots. So each soldier was carrying a good 200 pounds worth of stuff uh, each. You know, we had the new Molly rucksacks, which uh, it's, it's a modular system. You can just take it apart, put it together, whichever way you want. And those allow you to carry probably double the weight that a rucksack would carry, the old metal frame rucksacks. They are plastic frames, and uh, a couple of the guys, they're, uh, they're just broke during our tour. But uh, that, that was a good amount of weight itself, plus your regular, the new vest setup, which is the FLC, which uh, allows you to attach five million more things to your body, too, to weigh you down. The, uh, our A bags, and uh, in our cases, we also carried a B bag, so we had two duffel bags and a cot. And we were carrying everything that we were going to need to sustain us for a year's operation away from our battalion. Uh, and of course, you know, we, we do the landing, we're all running off the bird, it's pitch black, there's no one there to guide us in, so it's just, just guys scattering across the tarmac uh, in almost total chaos. You can hear ammo cans hitting the ground and people dropping things because we're, we're just too incredibly weighed down. I'm sure the Air Force guys got a laugh out of it if, if in fact there was nothing coming. Uh, we wound up uh, getting convoyed out within two days, I believe. Uh, the Sergeant Major, which was uh, Sergeant Major Smith from the 126, stopped down to pick us up and got a rude awakening because he was only expecting to pick up 30 to 40 troops and there was 80 of us there. Uh, there was the 40 from my platoon, and uh, or the platoon I was in at the time and uh, a good 40 soldiers from the first ID that had also landed that needed to be brought up. So they were not prepared to carry 80, but they made it happen. And uh, they came down with a lot of larger vehicles, like uh, Hemets and uh, some five tons. And if we had known the IED situation at that point, I don't think a single one of us would board those vehicles, because with the amount of gear we were carrying, which seemed to tick off the Sergeant Major because wondering why we didn't send it in the Connex, and meanwhile, we eventually wound up getting our Connex, I think, four months into our combat tour, so it was a good thing we did carry everything. Um, so it, after we filled all the vehicles, we mounted the back of the vehicles with all these rucksacks and A-bags, there was not much room left for soldiers. And uh, we basically sat on top of the gear with our legs dangling off the sides of the vehicles, weapons pointed out. And uh, we had guys in the back of tow behind trailers mounted full of gear with two to three guys sitting on that. And obviously with the, with the IED situation as bad as it wound up being, especially coming through our sector in, uh, MSR, on MSR Tampa, Main Supply Route Tampa, none of us probably would have gotten on those vehicles. And they'd even been hit on the way down and we didn't know that. Uh, luckily enough, from there back to our, our operating base, which was a uh, forward operating base, uh, Brassfield Mora, we didn't get hit. So none of us were any the wiser, really. So we got up to, to Brassfield Mora, and our, our first night, they had us sleeping by uh, the, the big mortar pit, and uh, none of us knew that. And, uh, we're in a very dark, existing warehouse. We, we wound up, Brassfield Mora was put on an old grain facility story, uh, a grain storage facility. And uh, it was a lot of empty warehouses, and bins filled with grain in some cases. Uh, but we stayed in one of the empty uh, warehouses the first night until they could get us situated with living quarters. And uh, the guns had an outgoing mission that night, and none of us knew. Well, we just know that we're in a pitch black warehouse that just starts, as soon as we laid down, went to sleep about an hour later, the building's shaking, you know, it's old, so little pieces are falling off of it. And, Guys are yelling, and uh, you know I, I was still squad leader at that time. At that time, the platoon sergeant, Sergeant First Class Forbes, was like, "Get your gear on, get against the walls, everybody get out!" Ah! Yelling and screaming, and uh, I was right near him because I was the weapon squad leader, so you're usually the closest person to the platoon sergeant. And uh, the PL was sleeping right by us too. Everyone's running around and scrambling, and then at one point I see the lieutenant, the lieutenant go back to his cot and sit down, and just take his gear off casually and put it under his bunk, lay down. Everyone's running and screaming and stuff. And uh, I look over at the lieutenant, I'm like, sir, what are you doing? And 
and uh, he said, I forgot, we're, we're right near the mortar pits and there's an outgoing mission. And everyone's still running around. So are you going to tell the guys or? Oh, they'll figure it out. <laughs> but that was, that was our first night. Um, very first mission that we wound up going out on, a red seat ride, uh, we wound up, uh, had a vehicle that ran our checkpoint and uh, one of the Bradleys gunned it down. And uh, so we, we got a, we got our introduction into combat our, for our first trip. <coughs> uh, we had to pull the three guys from the car and try to do what we could first aid on them. And uh, meanwhile, we're still, you're just, it was one of those ones that just our leadership went on for our platoon and uh, the Joes were back in uh, Contonement and, and they're basically taking us out to show us our sector and uh, show us, you know, what we'd be doing. And at that point, you know, you're fresh to combat. These guys have got a year in, you know, because it was the fourth ID that was we were doing the handoff with. And, uh, and so you're basically just following them around and following their lead and figuring out well, how, how you were going to break this out to your element when it happens. So, you know, we did what we could to help those guys. And uh, then our, our next mission out wound up being with the 1st Infantry Division. And once again, it was another right seat ride because the first ID got there about a month before we did, so they had a couple more missions in. And on that mission, uh, one of the Abrams tanks got hit with an IED. Uh, as a result, the 126's SOP was just a return fire in every direction at that point, which was a little insane. They toned it down after a couple missions. But as a result, they lit up one of our vehicles and uh, with their coax with a 762. Luckily enough, it was one of our up-armored vehicles, and no one was hurt, but just the same, uh, I wasn't in the vehicle. But uh, it definitely uh, kept the eyes open to everybody in that vehicle from that point out. So it was, it was a little bit of a rough start, uh, getting integrated. Uh, also getting integrated with uh, active duty, uh, the, the one story that best surmises how we were treated initially was uh, I had taken all of our saw gunners out to this little pit out in front of uh, out in front of our operating base to just to zero the, the weapons. And uh, these couple of privates from the 4th ID that were still hadn't flown out yet were on a garbage detail and they came over and asked if they could borrow the uh, Pioneer kit from our home V, which is the axe and the shovel and all that other stuff. And, uh, and I, I told them, you know, yeah, fine, just bring it right back. We, you know, we can see where they were. And, uh, so I asked the soldier, who was a specialist, and I asked him, I said, you know, when are you guys getting out of here? The first ID is already here. How come you're not gone yet? And the soldier's exact response was, some half-ass National Guard units were placing us, and they're late, they haven't done anything right, blah, 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 blah. So I was like, really? What exactly is it they were supposed to? They're supposed to be here already, and uh, they're just all fucked up. And those were his exact words. And I said, well, does their patch look something like that? And the kid's jaw dropped, of course. And I said, hey, look, true. The first ID is replacing the fourth ID, and the first ID is an active duty unit. We are supplementing them. We are not supposed to be here for another month. We're on an ad bomb party, advance party. So it's them you need to put your gripes with. Bring me back my pioneer kit when you're done. So, you know, that was kind of the introduction we got to them, but by the time we got well into our tour, our actions had spoken for themselves. When the division commander came down, General Batiste came down, to view how his soldiers were doing in Samara, he came out and checked us out. The first, the 126 sent them out, sent him out, you know, maybe they just didn't want the attention, whatever. But the general came, the division commander comes down to see how one of his battalions is, you know, is, is operating in combat, and he spent most of his time with our unit, our checkpoints, our traffic control points, our patrols, and was genuinely pleased. And by the time we wound up leaving Iraq, uh, the, the 126 chain of command would always say the same thing. We've got to make sure we bring a National Guard unit every time we go. And uh, it made contact with us. The 126 recently redeployed from a second tour in Iraq, and they had called us to see what was going on with us if we were going again, which I thought was pretty nice, you know. But, uh, now, was your equipment on par with the regular Army's equipment? Our equipment, in some cases, was better, and in some cases, it lacked. Mm -hmm. um, we wound up getting issued during a rapid field initiative when we were down in Fort Polk, the, the new helmets, the ACHs, the Army Combat Helmet. Uh, the, first, uh, the first ID didn't wind up getting those until two-thirds of the way through their tour. Uh, this new helmet, as we uh, definitely found out later, 
uh, was good against a 7.62 round, 7.62 by 3.9, which is the typical AK-47 round. Uh, there was a lieutenant and a PFC that were attached to us from the 25th Infantry Division that were attached to the 126 that took shots directly to their helmets and both survived. And uh, this was the, the, the new standard issue helmet. Uh, we got those prior to even entering combat. Um, now what would happen with the old Kevlar helmet? Would the bullet penetrate that or? Yeah, I would imagine so. Uh, I wouldn't want to test that. According to when they uh, when they went through the tests with the, with the ACH prior to giving them to us, they told us that the old PSGT helmets wouldn't, or PGT, whatever, the, the old Kevlar helmets mm -hmm. probably wouldn't have taken a direct shot with the 762 by 39 uh, Either way, I wouldn't want to test either helmet, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> they told us that was the better one, and I even have the pictures of those helmets as I was the one who had to return them to those soldiers, so uh, looking at them, and it's one thing that I definitely made sure my soldiers saw, hey, remember every time I yell at you for putting your helmet on? Hey, here you go, take a look at these pictures. You got a lieutenant who wound up with a scratch on his head and a PFC who just got knocked unconscious. Here's your proof. Uh, but you did mention something about the um, night vision. There were some difficulties with that. It wasn't so much the night. There was a couple different issues. One with the night vision, one with the thermal sights that we had. Uh, the past 13 uh, thermal sights that we were uh, issued, um, which actually I think I misquoted the toe. The toe was in the MPAS-5. But the, the PAS 13s that we were issued for Iraq were better than the old toe PAS-5 sights, um, but they were made of plastic. And not only were they made of plastic, which made them incredibly lightweight, and they were very effective as far as using them, it wasn't a solid plastic, and the components inside were so small that it was almost like hollow plastic around whatever was inside. And as a result, anything to hit these things hard enough punctured them, broke them. Uh, I think out of the 12 or 13 that we had, we lost almost all but two were broken uh, by the time our tour was done. Uh, it worked very well, but it was uh, it was a it, 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 I don't know whether it was to cut costs or to cut the weight or to do whatever. But it was it was only a couple pounds being plastic. I, I would have rather had it be a couple more pounds and had it be some kind of metal. But those constantly broke. Um, one of the other problems that we ran into on a much larger scale was the uh, the mounts for our night vision. Uh, most of us had PVS 14s, which is the monocular. It's a down sight so you can still use one eye while the other one has it which uh, I believe yeah I, I well, have I that, you hold that up while you're... yeah this was the uh, that's a picture of me with the uh, with the full gear with the PAS for or the uh, PDS 14 monocular um, there was on the site you have the mounting bracket on the helmet itself and then there's a piece that hooks to that that we all call the, the rhino or the horn because it just sticks out of your head like a rhino's head in you know, a horn. And then there's a little arm that attaches to that and the arm can clip in or clip out of the, the rhino. And uh, it has a little screw on it which screws into the top of the, the monocular itself. When you're not using it, you can flip the whole system up and it just sits there in place. And when you use it, you flip it down. The arm itself was plastic and they broke. They all broke. So many of them broke that it got to the point where guys would jerry rig them and they would put them up and tape them. And you know, you could flip it up and flip it down, but the tape would obviously, temperatures, we had temperatures certain days reach up over 160 degrees, and obviously that wreaks havoc on tape, whether you're using a piece of equipment or mm -hmm. it's just sitting in a pouch. Um, the, uh, so the arms for those PBS 14s broke very frequently. and. You know, the supply sergeant would have a couple extra, but when you're looking at an authorized strength of 144 troops in a company, you didn't have 144 arms. So uh, sometimes we'd have to trade in. He'd have extra pairs of night vision, like uh, seven deltas, which is uh, double eye pieces coming down to a single, uh, to a single out lens. And uh, some of the guys had to trade in their PBS 14s for those. And uh, then eventually you just work your way to your lower and older models of night vision just to keep everybody mission capable. So uh, that, that was definitely an equipment issue. Another issue we had was with the, uh, the vests. The ballistic vest had uh, what they call the sappy plates. Uh, one for the back, one for the chest, one for the back. When we were issued ours in Kuwait, they had no back plates, so we got two front. 
and with sweat and much stretching, uh, they eventually conform to your back. Um, uh, yeah, as far as effective, uh, we didn't really see many people take shots to you know to the chest or the back. Uh, the ones that did seemed to make it out all right, a little bit more angry, but you know. Um, other equipment deficiencies. Vehicles. Uh, during our tour, I had gotten a brand new, straight from the factory, M1145, which is supposed to be the double-plated Humvees, and I was very happy with this. When, when we got in country, we were supposed to be on foot. Uh, my entire career I had spent in the motorized infantry as a tow gunner. Uh, when we got in country and we were attached to the 126, they basically informed us, hey, your patrols for the most part are going to be in vehicles or at least that's what we'd like to see. We'd like to see some presence on foot. Uh, they gave us vehicles, and um, most of the vehicles they gave us, obviously, were the lower end ones are the ones that they had. They obviously didn't want to get rid of their good stuff and, and go in the old stuff. And they gave us vehicles I was very familiar with, the old uh, aluminum, aluminum and Kevlar Humvees, uh, non-armored. We uh, wound up cutting out quarter-inch pieces of steel plating, which I, I, I should have given you a picture of those. We used to call them our Road Warrior vehicles because it looked like something out of the Mel Gibson movie, Road Warrior, because we're taking this rust-colored quarter-inch steel plating and we, we made up molds to put against it, draw on it with a piece of chalk, and then with a plasma cutter, cut it out. So we all picked up some extra trades in Iraq out of survivability uh, count. And, uh, we, we put plates on each of the doors. We put skirts along the bottom under the doors. Uh, we took pieces the size of the floorboards and double plated the floorboards because of the IED and landmine issues. Uh, we had a lot of landmines, the little plastic Italian ones. Um, so we cut the pieces to those down and we double plated them and then, you know, through with the plasma cutter, went right through the center of them and then just bolted them to the floor. Um, and now, how, how effective were these modifications? Uh, against 7.62, very. Mm -hmm. Against IEDs, uh, an IED is an IED. I saw tanks and up armored Humvees melt down with IEDs. It depends on the size of the device. Mm -hmm. Most of the devices they were using were uh, 105 to 155 artillery rounds, uh, and they would link anywhere. They would daisy chain or link anywhere from one to however many they could grab hold of. and. Uh, depending on how close it was, the setting of the device on the road. Numerous times my vehicle was sprayed with debris from IEDs, but because they were improperly set, they weren't effective in taking my vehicle out or other vehicles in my platoon. Uh, a lot of the roads in Iraq, especially the main supply route, a lot of the larger uh, main roads to get to different cities and towns, long distance roads, uh, were fills. They're basically, they built up to keep at a consistent level and then just paved over the top of it. So a lot of the roads were fills. And as a result, on each side of the road, it would slope down to get to the normal size of, or the elevation of what the ground used to be. Uh, since we were getting better at spotting the IEDs, and I don't mean just us, just the US in general, um, one of the things they started doing was trying to reposition them. Or, you know, maybe they'd put them on the back side of a telephone pole. If you're traveling in this direction, it would be on this back side of the pole. You know, and uh, or they would just they, they they initially started just sliding them down on the fill on the side of the road, and what it wound up doing is it kind of made it almost into a shape chart. Instead of sitting on the side of the road and just blowing out in all directions, it's now sitting on the side of the hill, so it goes up and out that way. And we would catch kind of backblast of rocks or shrapnel hitting the side of the vehicle, and uh, you know we'd lose a tire or you know uh, our antenna or something. Um, it was, it was, I can't say rare, but it was uh, not as frequently as they'd probably like that they were actually effective. Uh, as far as uh, the armament that we put on the vehicles, we, uh, we also wound up having five tons to transport our second and third platoon, because it was just my platoon that was given vehicles. They, we did a big reorganization, and the guys with vehicle experience, for the most part, they put into one platoon. And that's the platoon they gave the vehicles to, and that's when I moved to first. Uh, the platoon sergeant I had, which uh, I won't name, but he had a very hard time adapting to a combat environment and uh, 
practically locking himself in his little living area and didn't really come out too frequently. So I got moved to that platoon, and this wound up happening with him within the next coming weeks. And our platoon leader, we had lost to the XO position because our XO left country eight days in with appendicitis or something. Uh, so I moved to a platoon that had no platoon leader and then a platoon sergeant that basically locked himself in his room and literally wet himself. Um, so basically I went from an E6 squad leader, actually an E16 leader from the very beginning to squad leader to now acting platoon sergeant slash platoon leader. About halfway through my tour they actually promoted the next guy in line. He came into the platoon as an E7. He took over as the platoon leader in the lieutenant's position and I stayed in the platoon sergeant position. Um, so we had all the vehicles in that platoon and uh, they gave us uh, a lot of old 113s, the, basically a box on a track. We'd mount a 50 cal or a 240 on the top. And the 240 is a replacement for the M60. Um, and then we had a bunch of Kevlar and aluminum Humvees that we did our Road Warrior cob jobs to. And uh, they didn't look like much, but they helped. And uh, then we wound up starting out with three up armored Humvees, uh, 1114s and 1114s. Um, eventually, throughout the tour, the picture I was holding up, we eventually got three brand new 11, one, uh, 1145s, which are the double plated. Uh, and they put a larger diesel engine in them to give the power. Uh, the problem with the larger diesel engine is it reconfigured the actual engine itself. And being a new vehicle, one, they didn't have the Dash 10 manuals to be able to properly do the maintenance on them, to read through and say, okay, this is what I need to do. This. They didn't have those yet, and they didn't have replacement parts for the engines. Uh, like any vehicle, there's a break-in period with them. You're not supposed to go over this many miles per hour for so many miles, whatever. Unfortunately, in a combat situation, we were losing vehicles left and right um, due to whatever, due to combat, due to just you know needing to wait for the parts to come in, whatever. So we had to use them. So they got a trial by fire. And as a result, the very first day, one of them died. Radiator blew on it, belt snapped. Uh, the serpentine belt itself was totally different than any other belt in any other home V, and that vehicle literally sat for two months until we got a replacement belt for it, um, which was very upsetting considering, as far as armor was concerned, it's one of our strongest vehicles. Uh, eventually, we got the belt replacement for it, but the engine was never right after that. Just to, the, the, the mission that the vehicle had to go on the day it died, its first day, was for about one week in country, we were tasked with escorting fuel carriers from FOB Tinderbox, which was far north in Iraq. These were vehicles coming from Turkey. And we had to drive them all the way down MSR Tampa, which was loaded with IEDs, to uh, logistical supply area Anaconda, which is where all the large fuel supplies went to. So we had to go past our operating base all the way down. And it was, you're looking at a good 16 plus hours worth of driving in a day. And uh, we would have four to six vehicles, or be uh, you know armored vehicles, and then you'd have uh, roughly 70 fuel trucks that we'd have to move with four to six vehicles. And uh, and our guidance was, if you lose a vehicle, if a vehicle gets hit, leave it because you've got 69 others, you have 68 others, just keep going. And that's what would happen. We'd be on these convoys, and IEDs would go off and take out a fuel truck, and we just have to move up there and make sure we maneuvered all the other vehicles around it and keep going, see if you could get the driver out. If the driver was done, the driver was done. You know, he went around the vehicle, he kept going. We, we had the mission for like a week. And that vehicle, the very first day, it went out. It was done. Uh, one thing we did notice, though, when we had the retaking of Samar, which was an eight-day battle, the up-armored vehicles, I don't know what rounds they used, but there were still rounds that penetrated the, the, the double armor vehicles because we had a couple issues. Uh, no one got hurt, luckily enough. Uh, my gunner in, uh, that was in one of the other vehicles, the round came through the vent on the hood, which was, it was an easy penetration. They could have done that with a regular round. Went through the, uh, the vent on the hood, hit the engine, and while he was up in the turret, blew some fluid, I think transmission fluid or something came flying back, somehow it came through the vent, the air vent of the vehicle and blew all over him. And he starts screaming, oh my God, I'm hit, I'm bleeding, oh my God, because he had hot fluid all over him all of a sudden. And uh, it's like, you, you dumbass, <laughs> just wipe yourself off, you know? But uh, 
yeah, they, uh, they, they were pretty decent vehicles. Equipment was all right. Now, were the, the tankers, were, were they mostly driven by contractors? The, yeah, they were Turkish. Turkish? Yeah, okay. Turkish. Uh, the, the, they were Turks that uh, were contracted out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how they got back up to Turkey. I wound up falling on somebody else, apparently. But uh, ours was to take them from up by, uh, we, we would go up to uh, Ford Operating Box, uh, Ford Operating Base Tinderbox, which was up near the border, and take them all the way down. Halfway, basically, you're going probably about a fourth of the length of the country. Now, what, were your, what was your food like? Did you have a contractor for your food? Uh, no, not, not on our operating base, we didn't. We wound up having a makeshift dining facility Eventually, one of the buildings there was developed into an actual dining facility. Yeah. But uh, for a while, we had tents, and they just cooked up uh, old sea rats or whatever, the stuff in the tins, they, where they just throw it in boiling water. And, and uh, then we had MREs for other meals. Mm -hmm. You know, it was usually uh, every now and then, if you were lucky enough to be back on the operating base, you, uh, you might have gotten a hot breakfast and an MRE lunch. And if you were lucky enough to be back on the post, you get you know a hot dinner. Usually, uh, the, the guarantee for the day was the hot dinner. Uh, the breakfast was, uh, you know, as long as they had the supplies, whatever. Every now and then we ran out of stuff. Uh, and they tried to send water to us in the giant water limits, but they would get gunned down on the side of the road. Even if they didn't do anything to the vehicle carrying it, they, they put holes in the water limit, obviously, we weren't getting everything we needed to. So we I was just going to ask you that. How did, did you keep supplied with water, or they must have had same they wound up digging us a well eventually, and uh, which the, the first one they dug us collapsed. And uh, we had we had some KBR contractors, about a half a dozen, and uh, they they dug us a, a well, a well, and uh, it wound up collapsing. Eventually, they they dug us another one, and it kept us pretty well supplied. As far as drinking water, they. they we would go. They would go on logistical supply runs every week or every couple of weeks down to Anaconda, and there's a lot of times we were tasked with security for that. They would go down. They would get pallets upon pallets of water and bring them back up to us. You know, and uh, that, that was pretty much the water we did have. Now, were you drinking mostly warm water? Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I lucked out partway through my tour because uh, there was an SF group. Actually, there were three different SF groups throughout our tour, special forces groups, that. Uh, we got the, the last two months of one group's rotation, all six months of another group, and the first couple months of the next group coming in. Our third platoon wound up rotating a squad at a time down to the ODA, the Special Forces Safe House, which was right at the mouth of the city. And they would send them down there to help with either security on the ODA compound while they went out and ran missions, or sometimes they'd supplement them on the missions. My roommate, since I got in the country with third, as part of third platoon, my roommate was on that rotation a lot. And uh, one of the SF guys took a liking to him, and when they rotated out, he gave him a refrigerator. And uh, we wound up starting to freeze stuff in the little tiny refrigerator we had. So we wound up getting a, a couple more that we started freezing bottles of water. And then by the time you're done with mission, if you, it, it would all be melted anyways. But. Uh, one of the first times they landed an incoming round on our FOB, they, they tried for months. For the first so many months we were there, they, uh, they kept shooting and coming at us, God, sometimes five times a week, a couple times a day. But they never got them inside our FOB, our operating base. And our operating base would probably be about the size of uh, the property of what used to be Latham Circle Mall, maybe like a small mall type property size that we had an entire battalion on. So if they had gotten them in, they probably would have hit something, but they just were not accurate. And uh, the first night they got one in, you know, we, we, we hear the incoming round come in, obviously it sounds different than all the others this time, because this one hits inside the perimeter. And that was probably like June of our tour. The, uh, we all, you know, ran to, they called for incoming, we all ran to the bunkers, we got in the bunkers, and uh, we wound up, uh, seeing flames coming up from one of the other warehouses. And uh, we kind of laughed and cheered about it because we saw that it wasn't one that uh, people were in or that people were normally in. And uh, we laughed and joked that, uh, that the insurgents finally got one in on us. It took them five, four or five months to get one in, but they finally did. 
Well, we came to find out that what they had hit was the storage area where they had all the freezers that they were going to give us. We, we weren't too happy after we found that out. But a couple other times they sunk some in. I was getting ready for a patrol one time, and I had all my soldiers out there, and I'm going through our patrol brief, and we hear the first round launch. And a lot of the times they were so close you could hear them launch, and then you'd get the concussion. And uh, we heard it launch, and then we heard it hit outside the pub. And so we hesitated a second. I wasn't about to call everybody out to you know the bunkers just yet because it sounded like it was a good distance out. But then the next one came right into the fob and hit about 70 feet away from us, and it hit an ammo truck. It, of all the perfect targets they could have gotten, they hit an ammo truck. So it was it blew up. It's on fire. Stuff's cooking off. So you know obviously we all ran to the bunkers at that point. But uh, yeah, they, they got a little bit more accurate. But luckily enough, the amount of times they were launching them during the week decreased. You know, instead of every five days out of every seven, it was one out of every eight or nine days we were taking incoming, but they, they got a lot more accurate. And we noticed that the local contractors, the Iraqis that would come in to empty our, uh, you know, our septic or whatever, we noticed uh, coincidentally the days they didn't show up were the days that we took incoming. So uh, we definitely established a real Real soon on, we established a mm -hmm. link between the, the local populace and the, the insurgents. Now, you said you were there when uh, the Thomas Hamill were, was uh, rescued? Yep. That was a joint mission between our third platoon and my platoon. Um, what happened is our commander <coughs> was very much so into trying to make a name for us in the National Guard. It, he was trying to make us look good. We were a National Guard company mm -hmm. with an active duty battalion, but unfortunately, it was kind of coming out of our hides and our sleep. He would volunteer us for extra missions all the time, and you know we come off a 12-hour mission and roll right into another 12-hour mission just because the commander went to the battle up brief and found out who wasn't covering down on what and grabbed it. That's what the case was with this. Uh, we had just gotten back from a mission, and uh, the commander went and got us another mission. It turned out not to even be in our sector, and uh, it was uh, contractors of Blackwater had been bringing uh, people out to repair. They had been pulling security for people to repair the oil, the oil line, which kept getting hit by the insurgents. Uh, they kept getting ripped up. So they they sent they sent out military and they sent out elements from that sector. As soon as that element got there, in dismounting the vehicles, one of their key leaders shot himself by mistake and like the ankle blew out part of his foot or something. It's in the middle of God's country, nowhere, and the only way you can reach anyone is the Blue Force tracker, which is satellite. And uh, so they just medevaced them themselves and got out. So that mission was left uncovered. It wasn't even on our sector, though, but our commander jumped on it. So uh, coincidentally, that morning, the lieutenant from 3rd Platoon said, hey, did you hear? It's been 30 days that that soldier and Thomas Hamill have been missing. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't get news in my hooch, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we drive out into the middle of nowhere. We get within two to 300 meters of the grid cord that we're supposed to be at. And now the dirt road we're on goes that direction but the grid is in that azimuth. So the other platoon sergeant and I start talking. We, we, we decide, you know, hey, why don't you dismount a squad or two of yours, have them go in that azimuth. We'll continue following the road and see if they come together at some point or if we find, you know, the, the, the pipeline or whatever, because we haven't found the pipeline yet. So he's like, yeah, okay. He dismounts his guys. We're in the middle of nowhere. There's their houses are all about a half a mile apart from each other. We wind up finding the pipeline, we're waiting for them to come across, and we can see them coming towards us, and uh, they mount up, we're getting ready to leave, and a call comes over the radio from one of the third platoon squad leaders, hey, there's a guy running right at us. And uh, we're like, well, does he have a weapon? Take it easy, calm down, does he have a weapon? Is he firing? He's coming right at us, and we look out the window, and we see the guy fall. I was like, oh, God, somebody shot him. And uh, he gets back up, and he starts running again. And uh, what does he trip? He goes back down again. I'm like, what the heck is this guy doing? Is he drunk? And uh, then we get a call over the radio again, because he was coming towards the back of our, our element. Mm -hmm. he's, he's yelling to us in English. He's saying, I'm an American. I'm an American. Oh my god, don't leave me. And uh, so you, know, you don't hear that every day. So we all got out of the vehicles, and it was Thomas Hamill. And uh, he said he threw himself down a couple times so we wouldn't shoot at him. He wanted to identify himself as non-hostile. Mm -hmm. And what had happened is the squad that had been on foot walked right past the house and what we called a shed, but it looked like their house, but smaller, and back. He was in that shed and had no doors, and what they did is they took a piece of sheet metal and propped a stick or a pole against it to hold it in place to 
keep him from running, and there's a guy outside with an AK guarding him. And the soldier, they had just recently split them four days prior. Um, he basically, as our squad went through, this guy dropped his rifle, ran over to the field with the people that lived there, and pretended like he was working all of a sudden. Our guy swept through, went right past it, linked all the way back up again, you know, without cutting across their property. Right past their property, went, linked up with the vehicles, and he heard the vehicles running, and he had seen the soldiers in the distance going by. He kicked down the door, and it really wasn't a rescue, per se. Mm -hmm. He kicked down the door and ran to us, basically. He got the opportunity, and he took advantage of it. Um, we went back, we rounded the people up in that house, and uh, we noticed that it was husband, wife, child, and standing alone was an individual. You know, one of these things is not like the other type of routine. And uh, we sent in our request to medevac him via the Blue Force Tracker, because we couldn't do it on the radio. A bird, a Blackhawk, came in and grabbed him, and then uh, they sent Delta Force up from Baghdad to search the rest of the area, because they still had to find the specialist that was missing. And. Uh, and once Delta Force showed up, they're like, yeah, we got this, you guys. You guys got it. Okay, let me stop it here and we'll put in a new tape. Okay, we're rolling. Okay. Um, yeah, Delta Force had shown up and uh, uh, seeing that no one would be able to really ever figure out who the people were, I guess I could tell the story. They, they show up and we give them a briefing on uh, what's what's going on. And they know that they, we start talking to Mr. Hamill and he said, hey, just four days ago we were in the chemical plant down here by Lake Tharthar, which is the big chemical plant that was always on the news. And that was the last I saw this specialist. And then they split us and I've been here for the last four days. Um, the Delta Force guys rounded up everybody within a couple mile radius and separated them, you know, male, female, children, whatever. And they took all the males and started interviewing them. And at first what they were doing, I got a little nervous that they were doing something improper. And it would probably be deemed as improper anyways, but no one was hurt. They, we were right by the canal, and there was all high reeds there. Hello? And they took the first guy down to the canal to yes, interview uh, him. Are you we hear a couple gunshots, and he comes back up by himself, grabs another one, yeah, goes back down. Going, and I look at the other platoon sergeant, should we do something here? And uh, they get to about the fifth guy, and then they come back up, and I see them get into a huddle, and they start talking. One guy goes down to the reeds and brings up all five guys. They were fine. What they did is they brought the first guy down. They asked him questions, got what they could out of him, if nothing, gagged him, threw him in the reeds, fired a couple shots in the water, went and got the next guy. And they did it until they got someone to talk. And uh, we all kind of wiped the brows after that. And uh, at that point, they were they were more than willing to, to, to push us off. You know, Delta Force, they knew they're, they're the elite of the elite. They're going to do their thing. So they're kind of dismissed, so to speak. And they went and did a raid of the chemical plant. And I don't know what was ever yielded out of that. But uh, it, was, it was a really good deal. I, I, I don't really, as a platoon sergeant, I didn't get much time on the phone because I was always busy with something between being volunteered for extra missions by the commander and then obviously as a platoon sergeant with no platoon leader, having to be at all the meetings to plan for the next mm -hmm. night. I didn't really get much time. Give you an idea, I bought like $100 worth of air time and, you know, for the phone card. To mm -hmm. this day, I still have over $60 of it. And, uh, and that includes the time that I spent on the phone in Kuwait during my leave. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, um, I called my wife that day. And I was like, you know, if anything good comes out of this entire tour, today was it. I was like, we found a guy that had been in captivity for the last 30 days. I had no idea this guy was even in captivity. Because like I said, I don't get news. But uh, it was great. We found this guy. I mean, it, don't be mistaken. It was no heroic thing. It was no, uh, you know, special forces going in to get Private Jessica, whatever her name was, you know, out of mm -hmm. hospital captivity. This was he saw us. and came to us. <laughs> he just had the opportunity. And uh, I was like, so if anything, if nothing else comes good out of this, we got that. And uh, my wife's like, oh, so you were there for that? I was like, oh, yeah, I was there. I took some of the pictures and blah, blah, blah. Are you in any of the pictures? No. But I took some of them. So you'll probably see my pictures on the news, but you mm -hmm. won't see me. So me and uh, a couple other soldiers have taken pictures, and we put them all together, and some guys from uh, the leadership from 3rd Platoon wound up 
going down to uh, their platoon leader, platoon sergeant, and uh, a couple other squad leaders. Basically, the people that were in the pictures that were sent mm -hmm. wound up going down to Baghdad and interviewed. And it was all over national, international news. And uh, with the most famous picture being uh, Thomas Hamill in the middle with uh, my medic, Sergeant Burns, and uh, Sergeant Diedrich on the other side. And basically doing the, the handshake with Thomas Hamill in the middle. But uh, and that, that was great. And it was good that something, you know, mm -hmm. besides the missions that we used to do, like, uh, Giving food out to the locals, things like that, uh, which you know that was that other the, one of the other pictures there. That was uh, not only do we have the city of Samara, but we had uh, the four outlying towns. We had Alcala, which was this one, Al, Al Araka, Al Huish, and a town that we never found the name of. We called it Two Brothers Village because there was these two brothers we were trying to capture, and that was their village. And it was the only thing that we ever really did in mm -hmm. that one village. And the best part about that is it was my platoon and second platoon on that mission. Um, and in the same vehicle with second platoon as platoon leader. And we're talking over what the mission is. And uh, we, as we come rolling into the town, he's pointing at the building that, you know, if you, that's the building from, uh, from the op order, you know, the operations order. That's the one we got to hit. And I point to the one two before it saying, are you sure it's not that one, sir? Because that's the one that's got two guys running from the back of it right now. And it, it turned out to be, in fact, that those were the guys and they, they had gotten away. We didn't, we didn't get them. We never really did too much in that town besides that. Uh, the one in the picture was Alcala. And uh, those it was a very US friendly town. Um, in that picture, we're giving out stuff from our own uh, health and welfare packages that we received from home. Mm -hmm. uh, it got to be to the point where some of our families were really, really taking care of us. Uh, my wife, who is now the family readiness coordinator for Charlie Company 2 in LA, had been raising a lot of money, and there was a couple other families that had been. And my wife was sending me so much stuff, I was able to give my platoon most of my stuff. And then even guys from the 126, the active component, you know, most of those guys were young guys on active duty had too many kids than what their BAH could support, and their families weren't really sending them too much, you know. And we were giving stuff to the 126, we had so much. And then eventually even they were like, hey, we've, we've got enough, thanks. And uh, so we started giving stuff out to uh, the US friendly areas, and uh, Alcala being one of them. And uh, that picture was basically me being the, the short round that I am, you know. Went to Iraq, 5'8", came back 5'7". I still haven't figured that one out. but. Uh, they, uh, me standing on the hood of my home V with my troops around it, who are all like six, six two, six three, you know, providing uh, vehicle security so no one gets into the vehicle while I basically just throw things out to the crowd. And we used to do that a lot. We liked the people of Alcala. They were U.S. friendly. They used to help us out with a lot of information. And uh, Al Huish was pretty decent too. Al Araka, we didn't have too much interaction with. And Samara, unfortunately, those people were kind of forced to be the way they were. Samara, uh, Samara's population of about 250,000 people, last census was taken there. Uh, most people remember Samara prior to us getting there, is that's where all the U.S. prisoners were found. Um, all the, from the maintenance unit, uh, from what was it, Jessica Lynch, from her unit, from uh, the aviation, a couple of pilots that were captured, that's where they found them all, was Samara. Samara also was like the, the the capital of the entire Middle East centuries ago. It is a very big place. Um, and it's a place that Saddam was almost assassinated a couple times in, so that's why a lot of people stopped hearing about Samara. Um, there's a big, it, it's a pretty neat place. Uh, one thing that people know it from, and then other than us finding Thomas Hamill too, that people know it from is uh, the, uh, I can't even remember the name of the mosque, but the Golden Dome no, Mosque. Yeah. That's, that's where that was, and it was destroyed about a year or so after our tour by insurgents, which was a very important mosque in the entire Middle East. They had uh, two or three of the original caliphs, the kings of Iraq, buried under it. And, uh, it, you know, it was, just, it was a beautiful thing to look at, too. We couldn't go near it. With that. We, were, we weren't allowed within a block of it. We used to have to have our Iraqi soldiers do stuff. Even when we retook the city of Samara, we were taking fire from the Golden Mosque. Uh, we had to send the Iraqis in to, to take it, and they seized all sorts of weapons and killed insurgents. And, but you know, we couldn't go near it. One of the uh, one of the tank commanders, I don't know whether it was mistakenly or not, had put a round through the dome, 
And uh, I remember hearing it come over the radio, the battalion commander, no coal signs or anything. You just hear the battalion commander, that better not have been a tank round I just saw go through that dome. <laughs> Quiet. Uh, oh yeah, it was. What did I tell you about engaging the tank, oh, about engaging it in mo the mosque? Uh, yeah, my bad, sorry about that. But that was the conversation. <laughs> But uh, they were taking fire from it. It's kind of hard not to return fire on mm -hmm. something you're taking fire from, especially because, you know, within that vicinity or close to that vicinity is where uh, Sergeant Giovanni was shot, and uh, he, he died of his wounds. And, uh, and actually, he was the only one, and he was 2nd 108th Infantry. He had only been attached to us eight days prior. He, uh, he took a shot, and it, it was a luck shot. It had actually gone through a couple different things, and under his arm, missed the vest completely. Pretty much choked on his own blood, he died. And uh, the SF guys, there, the SF medic ran blocks to get to him to take care of him. They were on the roof of the hotel, which is about three stories. And uh, by the time he got to him, he was done. But uh, you look at his equipment, not a single mark on his equipment, no blood on his equipment, nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just that one lucky shot, so you're a guy. But, um, so yeah, you, t you take fire from a mosque and cameras. Easter Sunday was the day we lost our first guy. We lost Nate Brown, and we had six others wounded. And we were a lot luckier. I wasn't in that element. Half of my platoon was. I was in another area at that time. What had wound up happening is our commander got, it was during, uh, during one of the religious weeks, obviously. I mean, you've got Easter for us, and they have their own thing going on. And we were ordered to stay out of the city for those seven days. During that time, the SF Safe House was still in the city, and they had and one of our squads from 3rd Platoon, and they had a view on what was going on. And every couple of hours, we're getting updates. Hey, look, the Iraqi police, they're helping the insurgents. We're watching them set up roadblocks here. We're watching them move ammo. We're watching them move vehicles. You guys don't want to come into this section of town because it's pretty bad right now. And meanwhile, we had a cordon pretty much of the entire city. Uh, we're all around the outskirts, all of the 126 and us. And uh, we're waiting for the last day of uh, the mission because it was basically seven straight days out in the field while this was going on but we couldn't go into the city so the last day shows that we agreed with the council not to go in the city and the city council so we the last day we we're going to go back into the city and the commander gets a call on the radio from battalion saying you need to go into sector seven which is right in the center of the city you need to go into sector seven you need to do a cordon and raid of sector seven and we've been getting word from SF all week long, you don't want to go Sector 7. That was one of the worst sectors in the city. And uh, we get the call, it's our mission, we have to do it. But the commander grabs 2nd platoon and half of my platoon and takes off. And the rest of us are sitting there like, where the hell is he going? Uh, this is a company movement. So one and a half platoons take off. They came up ASR, Alternate Supply Route Latoya, which came into the south west southeast corner of the city and uh they came up into they came up the asr they turned on to uh route heat we called it all the call signs have changed now but at that time uh, the the cities the uh west to east cities were named after basketball teams and the north to south were 10 20 30 40 50 and that's how we designated the street names they actually they wound up changing it like 10 months into our tour but that's what they were at the time they came up ASR Latoya, they turned left on heat, and as they were passing the mosque on heat, they were ambushed. Uh, they basically walked artillery in on them, mortar rounds. Uh, they had two IEDs set up, and, uh, or two or three. And then they had a bunch of elements set up for a small arms ambush. The element was basically two gun trucks, two five tons, and two more gun trucks. And uh, the five tons, we had started up armoring also. The lead one out of the two, we had put quarter inch steel plates, and they were like four by eight plates or something like that, two on each side, because normally a five ton has got the big tarpaulin on the back where the troop carrier area is. Obviously, tarpaulin does not protect against rounds of any kind. And uh, so we took the tarpaulin down, and since the seats normally in the back are left and right facing in, we took them off, we put them in the center facing out. So that way guys could sit mm -hmm. and scan left or right. And then we put like a, a gun mount up towards the front corner and a gun mount towards the back corner so you can mount one of the M249s or 240s on there and have some kind of 
you know, mobility with it, traversing, basically. And um, that vehicle had totally been done. The vehicle behind it had nothing. Luckily enough, they hit the vehicle that had armor, because if they had waited and hit the one behind it, it would have killed everybody, including the next guy you're about to interview, Sergeant Barcel. The, uh, when the ID went off, they, uh, it, it, the, the IEDs had gone off on the uh, first vehicle, and then they had launched RPGs into it from the rooftop, and the, the, the steel plating had actually repelled a good majority of the blast from the IEDs. Um, my gunner in the uh, five-ton had taken some shrapnel, uh, Specialist Nellis, and uh, was able to climb back up in and continue the battle, and uh, the guys in the back, which were in second platoon, took the brunt of it. Uh, Specialist, uh, Specialist Brown had taken an RPG to the chest, which killed him instantly, and everybody else in the back of the vehicle had taken shrapnel for it, and uh, from it. And uh, at that point, you know, that's that was that was pretty much, you know, what led into the events on that. The uh, and then obviously a firefight ensued from there. Um, but that, you know, the the plating on those vehicles. That from the modifications that the company had done, it had actually resisted a good majority of the blast. Unfortunately, there was no overhead cover on it, and, and that's where they wanted to move them out. But uh, so that, that was pretty. That was that. Uh, Sergeant Barcel could tell you a lot more about the firefight because he was actually in it. Um, so I forgot where we were actually at on that. Well, Wait. when did you go home? First time I actually left our area, I had left on a four-day pass. As far as actually going home, I didn't go home until towards the end of our tour. I went home late, uh, early October. Um, I believe I, I flew out somewhere the fourth or the sixth of October. Um, went down, spent a couple did, through the rotation, spent a couple days in Kuwait, and then uh, which is a good majority of the time I actually used my phone card <laughs> and. Uh, then from there, I went home. I was home for my 15 days. I made it home on the 8th, which was my wedding anniversary. I made it home that night, somewhere around 2100 hours, around 9 o'clock at night. So I made it home with three hours to spare on my wedding anniversary, which surprisingly enough was the first one I've ever been home for. And uh, I made it from the other side of the world. So uh, stick that in my wife's face every time she complains. But uh, yeah, I was home for my wedding anniversary. I was home for my son's birthday, which is October 20th. And then a day or so after that, I flew back. Uh, was it difficult going back after? It was. Being home? It, the, the worst part about going back was probably my youngest at the time. My youngest at the time was three months old when I was activated. Uh, at this time, she's well over a year old. And it's the first I've, re I've seen her in person since mm -hmm. she was three months old. And uh, the, the nice part about taking the leave late because we only had a couple more months left of our tour, was I got to introduce myself, basically, to my daughter at that point. And then that way, when I came home shortly after, she knew who I was. Mm -hmm. It wasn't me all of a sudden trying to force mm -hmm. myself into a relationship with her, or, 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 or. But, um, so that actually made, that, that made it easier as far as when I came home for good. As far as going back, uh, when I went home, we bonded instantly. It was almost like I was never gone. and. Uh, and that made it tough going back. My wife, you know, it, it's tough leaving your wife. It's tough leaving my older kids, but you know, my older kids were in their young teens. You know, I've spent my time. I spent some time with them. You know, I'm like my my baby. So that that was the hardest part about going back. Was, uh, was my three. Well, now she's my four year old, but at that point, you know, she's just over a year old. Mm -hmm. So as far as going back, going back and getting reintegrated wasn't too bad. Um, it was good to be back to see the guys. You know, the entire time I was back, you know, I got the news going, you see all the scrolls going, and one of the scrolls that came across the news and they gave absolutely no information on it was uh, Car Blast in Samara kills eight or kills 12. And immediately it's like, oh, God. You know, I, I didn't want any of the 126 guys mm -hmm. to die, but focus obviously was on two 108 guys. Just wasn't any of my guys. I didn't hear anything about it. It's in our sector, though. So, I mean, you go home and, you know, it, you kind of just keep thinking about those, you know, what's going on, what's, you know, what's happening, what's the latest, what's going to be like when I get back, you know. So, that, that was leave. 
Uh, one of the first things I did when I was home on leave, uh, my wife had gotten me tickets to go see a Jets game down in the Meadowlands. I'm a big Jets fan, uh, even with their 4 and 12 season this year. You know, whatever. But uh, so it was weird coming from an environment where you're trying to keep people off of you to all of a sudden being in a stadium with over 60,000 people. You know, that was that was definitely weird. But uh, luckily enough, you know, not even luckily enough, you know, I was at a Jets game. I was happy. Home, seeing the game with my wife. Okay, I was home seeing the game that made me happy. <laughs> but, uh, other than that, leave was relatively on event. But one nice thing about leave is that I got to see my wife's uncle already for the last time. He wound up passing away after I went back. So uh, it was, you know, it was good that I actually got to see him before he passed away. So. Well, this, um, I guess, what end this with uh, your Operation Jumpstart? Border Patrol. Border Patrol. My Border Patrol time was pretty uneventful. Um, we, uh, we were the initial group to go down, which was only three weeks. Uh, we get down to Arizona and they don't have anything set up yet. You know, this is the big surge, Operation Jump Starts, the big surge for Border Patrol. We're going to send one of the Zillion National Guard troops down to the border and it's going to stop people coming in illegally. Anyways, we get down there and uh, the leaders go out, we take a ride and look at the sector, and we were in Nogales, Arizona, and uh, you couldn't tell where the border was. There was no differentiating between Mexico or the U.S., in our sector anyways. Uh, when we got out there, I had a couple of the Border Patrols, a couple of Border Patrol people with me, and I looked at them, and I'm like, now, where exactly is the U.S. border to Mexico? Is it where that hill, where, that, where, that, where the ridge starts? or is it prior to that? Because we see people there all the time. You know, the, the couple of days we've been out here, there's been people over there. And they're like, uh, I would say if they come any closer than that, we, you should call it. Like, you can't even tell me where the border is. It's your border patrol. So uh, the problem also with, with Nogales is that a third of it's on the U.S. border, and the other two-thirds of it is in Mexico. So it's a town that's on the border. How you can control undocumented aliens coming through when the city shares. Anyways, we were only down there for th I was only down there for the first three weeks. The initial uh, the initial wave on it, and uh, they had such a hard time getting it started. We didn't really even spend that much time out on point. Uh, the time that we did spend out there. Uh, when you go through those back areas, it's, it's kind of sad to see that that's actually part of the U.S. because it was, it was disgusting, the, the desert down there in some areas. It was beautiful landscape, but with the amount of people crossing through, and you know, the Border Patrol guys were pointing this out to us, you'd, you'd be driving along these areas and you'd have different washes where basically you have no rain and all of a sudden they get the rainy season, it's a downpour and the ground is so unporous because it's so hardened that the water stays on the surface and creates little floods, which creates these little washes. And what it does is it gathers up all the equipment, so to speak, or bags or personal property that these people abandon in their trek across the border and the people that don't make it in the trek across the border and it collects all that up. And you just come across, you're driving down a dirt road and then there's a mound of book bags and a body or two in it. It was, just, it was insane. I couldn't even believe that it was like this anywhere in the U.S. And uh, as far as stuff that we saw, is, or we were a part of, well, there was soldiers in, in my element had stocks, I think, maybe a grand total if you added the entire, our entire platoon together, of maybe 40 individuals from coming across that were actually detained uh, within the, the time that we spent on the point. And then a lot of the times when we saw them coming over, we would call in for support, and they would send a helicopter out, and the helicopter would kind of dust them back over the border, which was like a temporary deferment. They determined they'd go to another area and just cross there. We had one individual, uh, we were just gaining light again, and uh, one of my soldiers was like, Ross, and he points right behind us. And there was a guy who had somehow, you know, throughout the night or whatever, had come across the hills near us and had gotten behind us. And we saw a big heavy set guy. And we see him just as he's dragging himself up onto the dirt road. 
these guys probably gone for miles all night long, nothing to see in the dark, so probably turned around in the hills, whatever, winds up within 100 meters of our position. And he gets up on the road, and he's hunched over, and he just looks left, he looks right, and then he looks back and sees us. And there's a Humvee with five armed soldiers sitting there, you know, and he's like, like he doesn't know which direction to run, and I just shook my head no, and I pointed at him and went like that. And he came up to us, we didn't have to go after him or anything crazy. He comes walking up to us, and I don't know much Spanish. And I was like, habla inglés? And he was like, sit down. And he had this water bottle on him, and it's just uh, so disgusting. Like, he just scooped it from a puddle, stuff floating in it. And I took his water from him, and I gave him one of our water bottles. And then Border Patrol showed up and took him away. You know, it was relatively uneventful. No one, they talked about, you know, the possibility of banditos. These people that hide on the border, and they loot and kill people passing back and forth. And uh, then you've got the drug runners, and they were telling us about how a lot of the drug runners have former soldiers that work for them and you know sometimes they'll take pop shots at them. We had nothing like that. It was relatively uneventful other than detaining some people. And legally we weren't supposed to detain. We kind of just offered for them to come and sit with us until you know Border Patrol showed up and they took them. So uh, we didn't force anyone to stay with us but they didn't seem like they were gonna run either. <laughs> but, uh, that was pretty much all a jump start really for, for the, the wave that I went on. They, that, it was, that was the part that they were really trying to figure out what they were going to do and how they were going to place the soldiers. So not too much went on that. So. Now you're in the Inspector General's office. How yep. long have you been? I, I've been with the Inspector General's office since uh, February of 2007. Unfortunately, I've spent a, a good majority of my time shifting around and doing other things, so I've missed a lot of my time. By the time I got the IG's office, I think in that April, I was going for a promotion school for E7. Um, for my platoon sergeant position with the unit. Um, I was gone for IG school for May, came back, I went to annual training in June, uh, did a little bit of AG, uh, IG stuff, you know, and uh, then I went to annual training again in October to get ready for, uh, they've got the wave going out, they had a couple of waves of soldiers going out to Afghanistan. So I had to go to AT to uh, help for the, uh, because we were mobilized to help train them to, to head out for Afghanistan. And uh, I think I'm finally back for a little bit of time now. <laughs> Actually do some IG work and help some troops out. Well, thank you very much for the interview. Oh, no problem.